the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. All right, I would like you, if you could, uh, take your Bible tonight and come with me to Mark 11, verse 21. Mark 11, verse 21. And uh, we have a number of resources and albums and things. Uh, We put out an album every year, and you can download it off iTunes. It got to be number one on iTunes for a couple of weeks. Uh, When it first got launched, it's called A Thousand Hallelujahs. It's written by my my son, uh, Daniel, uh, wrote the song A Thousand Hallelujahs. And actually, uh, my other son produced the album. And so, you know, it's uh, it's a very edifying uh, musical piece. And uh, you'll find other things on our website, which is myc3church.net, where you'll um, be able to find what else we have. Mark 11 and... What did I say? Oh, I'm in Matthew. Golly. I'm thinking that's not my scripture. And uh, Mark 11, 21 should follow the bookmark. All right. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Everybody say, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Wow, that's fantastic. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, this is a, this is a passage about faith. And in a world of fear, faith has become something that a lot of us, we really, really need this. Over in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, Paul says, we have the same spirit of faith. Everybody say, we have have the spirit of faith. faith. So before anything else, faith is a spirit. It's the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of God. When God comes into you, He doesn't come into you with fear. He comes into you with faith. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. You'll find that God makes you whole when He comes inside of you. He doesn't come to damage you or to hurt you. That's the devil's job. And it is amazing to me how much religion has twisted the view of God so that it Sounds as though he's very cruel, very mean. And now just about every insurance company in the world calls a disaster an act of God. The acts of God are healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, setting the captive free, opening the eyes of the blind. And you and I have him inside of us. And that's the fact that the God on the inside of you tonight is bigger than any problem you're facing. Doesn't matter what you're facing, the God inside of you is bigger than that difficulty. Now, He can do one of two things, and one we hear a lot about is that He can bring a miracle to that situation and change it, and that's awesome. When that happens, that is amazing, but that doesn't always happen. You see, in the first half of Hebrews 11, which is about all the heroes of faith, it says they had, they stopped the mouths of lions. They stopped the violence of the fire. They had miracles happen. But the second half of the book of Hebrews says they got eaten by the lions. But they were still the great people of faith. So here's the deal. Faith will will either bring a miracle to the circumstance or it'll let you live above the circumstance as it remains unchanged so that you live in victory. Now hear me, you cannot be an overcomer unless you've got something to overcome. And you might be facing what you think is an impossible circumstance and it isn't changing. Jesus is wanting you to discover the power of living above 
your circumstance so it doesn't affect your attitude, crush you, make your mind collapse, make you walk out, make you leave, whatever the situation is. He wants you to hang in there and discover the power of the resurrection where every day after day after day, you're living in victory in spite of your circumstances. You're above them, not below them. That's the spirit of faith. Faith is a spirit. It's David running towards Goliath. He didn't think, oh, what was I thinking? Tiptoeing around, oh, hope he doesn't see me. He ran, hair flying in the wind. I got you, you big ugly brute. And he's running. Oh, let's it fly. Takes out the giant. Faith is a spirit before it's anything else. The worst, the worst enemy of faith is complaining, whining, that nasal twang. No language going on in that hand. The Bible says God meets with him who rejoices. Isaiah 64, 5. He will meet with him who's happy, who's rejoicing. God is positive. He is light and in him is no darkness at all, John says. This is the message, John says. God is light. This is the message. God is light, bright, positive. Like all these beautiful singers up here tonight. What a boost to come to church and to think God only wants 10%. My Lord, it's amazing. We pay more for a footy football game and get depressed because the Patriots lose. My God. It's the thing is we have, we have such an opportunity every week to let joy come up on the inside of us. But that nasal twang, you've got to watch it. How many of you got children? Wow. Okay. Well, I, I've got three children and two grandchildren. And so is my wife. Amen. Okay, so oh, I loved all our kids. They're beautiful. Just loved them with all my heart. And, and then they were born. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you take your, you, you get your little kids, you know, you, you, you got your first little one and you're off to the supermarket and they can now, they kind of walk. Like, and it's cute. And up until two, they don't, have that wine, but then around about two, they get it, and they're going like, and then they grab your dress, they go, I don't want to go yet, I want to go home, I want to, I don't, I want an ice cream, I don't want to go, I want to go, I want to go, they got fluid coming out of every hole in their head, I don't want to go, I want to go, I don't want to go, you got that? And by the way, it's not my dress they're pulling on. I don't have one. <laughs> so, so, you're from San Bernardino. Did I say that right? You're from the Rock Church. You're intelligent. You're smart. You've been educated. You know what to do. You have another one. Amen. <laughs> so now you got two, right? Two of these things. They're in the back seat of your car. One's over here, one's over there. Don't look out my window. That's my window. Don't look, man. I don't want you. I don't want you to pull up my hair. I don't want you to pull up my eyes. You see me? I don't want. That's just on the way to church. So you take your little demon angels down to the children's church. And you're just so thankful that The Rock has got such a good children's program that you can take them to at least, at least for 90 minutes a week. <laughs> All right, so, so what do you do? You know, you're thinking, oh, what do we do? Well, it's, you, you're Southern Californian people. You're smart, bright. You have another one, amen. <laughs> now you've got three of these things. In the back of your car, you got the, the, little, the littlest one, just a baby in the middle. You do a drive through McDonald's. You come out the other side. This poor little kid's got French fries in his ears. And milkshake goes, I don't want to go. 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 You got all these kids like that in the back. Okay, here's the deal. God is driving the world 
There are seven billion people <laughs> in the back seat. I don't like you. I don't like you. I'm going to bomb you. I don't want to. Don't hit me. I don't want to. The wine. I don't want to. I don't want to. It is no wonder he says, I will meet with him who rejoices. Amen. I want somebody who's a little happy in the house, and I'm going to meet with them because I want joy. In a miserable world, give me some joy. That's what the spirit of faith is. We're going to win because we are winners. God didn't give birth to you to make you fail. He'd say, well, let's, let's give birth to a whole bunch of kids and make them just miserable. <laughs> what? No. You're no accident. You're here by design. He's not the God of oops. <laughs> he didn't go, oops. Didn't expect him. <laughs> Whoa, what do we do with him? <laughs> Golly. Think of something, boys. No, there's a design. You're here on purpose. You're here on purpose. You're here for divine purpose. But let me tell you this. You're not going to discover it in the dark. So what does that mean? That means walking around depressed and miserable. You want to live in the kingdom, you've got to cross certain boundaries, borders. Okay, so the borders are not, they're not ge geographical. They're not national. They're attitudinal. They're spiritual. So when I cross the border from doubt into faith, I put myself under the king dominion of Jesus. I am now under the dom of the king, ruled by the Lord, my attitude. And you say, yeah, but I just, I just, I just worry all the time. I just, I just nervous all the time. Well, just stop it. No, 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 you don't understand. I'm worried now about what's going to, stop it. Yeah, but what would I do if I didn't worry? I'd be, uh, you could try rejoicing. You could try praying. Yeah, but you don't understand. No, no, no. I got, I got to tell you, you don't understand my deal. I got way more problems than you. Mine are spectacular. I know you think yours are bad, but everybody's bad. Are bad. You think, oh, no, no, Pastor, that's this a little tough, you know? Yeah. I believe in a kind of a masculine kind of Christianity. One that, that is a little soldierish. And I think we've got to actually get a little more, you know, say, okay, let's stand up on the inside tonight. Let's not be a victim anymore. Let's be a conqueror. Amen. Try it out for a while. Just give it a shot. And you know how you start? You start by actually smiling. We should have a smiling revolution. Just put that smile on your face. In that You the Leader book, I spent a whole chapter on smiling. Because it's such an underest uh, underestimated and undervalued principle. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that says, man without smiling face should not open shop. <laughs> and that is the truth. <laughs> Love seeing your pastor get up here tonight, just smiling all over you. The smile of God. And once you start smiling, but you see, then nobody's going to give you sympathy. And that, that's a problem for some people. No, they won't feel sorry for me anymore. Yeah, right. That gets us out of that area. Yeah. It gets us into victory. Yeah. And we start helping others, yeah. reaching out, taking joy to them. The spirit of faith has got to get inside you. Okay, very quickly, I'm going to try and get through seven points here, but I just got to give you three directions of faith. The first is in God, which is very basic. You know, faith in God. Believe that He can do it. The second is, is where some people get a little, you know, their sincerity might stop them from doing this. Well, you believe in you. You believe, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without Him, I can do nothing, but with Him, nothing's impossible. I can do this. I believe that I can just about do anything if I put my mind to it. But as soon as people say, oh, I could never do that. I can't see myself doing that. You put yourself in the negative. You put yourself in doubt. You say, oh, I'm too nervous to do that. I could, I could never stand up and do that. I take risks with a lot of people, making them pastors, making them leaders, doing all kinds of things. And they don't believe in themselves, so I do their believing in them for them. I say, yeah, you can do it. And it's amazing what one drop of faith in a person can, can bring out of them. 
Our potential is maximized in an environment of believing. So you see, Jesus said to that fig tree, and this is where this teaching comes out of, he said to the fig tree the day before, he said, nobody's ever going to have fruit from you ever again. It's kind of interesting because the next day, when they're passing it, the disciples say, that fig tree that you cursed has died from the roots. Jesus did not say, I curse you, you fig tree. He just said, you're never going to bear any fruit. But they saw that as a curse. I've heard fathers say to their children, you're never going to amount to anything. That's as good as cursing them. But faith is believing something you can't see with your eyes. Faith is believing something that's not evident right now. And your child might be might be doing all the worst things on earth. Your husband might be doing all the worst things. Your wife might be doing the worst things on earth. There might be all kinds of things going wrong in your world. But right here tonight, make a commitment, a resolution. I'm going to start prophesying truth into a world that has got a negative reality for me. And I'm going to say, my my child's awesome. My kids are beautiful. Especially fathers, because they have a little challenge with, saying good things about their sons and their daughters. We graduate a lot of students out of our Bible college every year. and have done for, for the last 30 years. We have a school of ministry that goes for one, two, or three years, and a school of creative arts that does about seven streams of creative arts stuff. And so all these students come from all over the world, and they're there, and we're graduating, and the parents turn up. And I say, wow, you've done such a good job on your, your boy here. He's, he's, he's a magnificent child. He goes, yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, you don't know him like I know him, you know, yeah. <laughs> just can't bring himself to say, yeah, he's a beautiful kid. He's fantastic. And that's all a son is looking for. You'll be amazed at the memory of just one statement, how long it will last in a child's mind. All the days of their life, they'll feed off that one word of encouragement from a person who really matters in their world, like a father, like a pastor, like a teacher. So believing in God, believing in myself, and believing in other people are the directions of faith. So let me now take you through these seven steps of faith. The first is desire, where you need to be able to to, to express, this is what I want. This is what I would like to happen. Sometimes we're nervous about these things because we think, I don't know what God wants me to want. If I want the yellow one, he'll want me to have the blue one. He's like that, isn't he? And we have this view of God that he's kind of very difficult to get along with, kind of contrary. That if we said, God, this is what I really want, he says, is that what you want? Well, you're never going to get it. (laughs) We think that's, that's how God is, but he's not. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37, and I will give you the desires of your heart. He doesn't say when he'll give, but he says, it'll come. He'll give you the desires of your heart. If you delight yourself in the Lord, you're going to find it starts coming through to you. So then the next next step of faith is, James says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. So that's James 1. Verse 6 to 7, let him ask in faith with no doubting, with no double-mindedness. So there, there comes this huge thought of the will of God. And in our sincerity, sometimes we stop short of believing and taking a step. So we go, Lord, I want to do your will. And I want, to want what you want me to want. If you want me to want it, then I want it with all my want. Because all I want is to want the things you want me to want. If you want <laughs> that I want you to want me to want that. And that's what I will do. If you will that I do it, then I will do the will that you want for me to do. That's not how Bartimaeus answered Jesus when he said, what do you want? So so take it easy with the Lord. He's got a lot on his plate. It's just a very simple question. What do you want? What are you going to do? 
Well, Lord, I want your will. I want to want what you want. Said, no, 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 just, just tell me. What's on your heart? What, do you, what would you like to happen? I'm not, I'm not trying to be, don't say crazy things. Oh, I want to own America. I mean, uh, or, you know, some, I mean, just things that are within the world of your world of need and desire and direction. It's, it's God's supreme delight to bless his children with the kingdom. That's the reason he sent Jesus. Because God is good. And all that he does is good. And all that he brings you is good. So, so you got to decide it. All right? You got to make a decision. And that's, that's hard for some people. They, they, don't, they don't like, they, they'd like to think that, you know, something else is going to make a decision for them. Like God is the divine horoscope or he, he, I'm not responsible. Make a choice. What will you do this year in 2012? Make a resolution. I'm going to do that. And as you take a step, it says that man will start receiving things from the Lord. The third one is ask it. James 4.2 says you do not have because you do not ask. Okay, so now how do you ask? Jesus gives us three examples of how you're meant to ask for something from God. So he, he basically talks about a thing called importunity, which in your margin of your Bible states it's barefaced unashamedness. Barefaced unashamedness. It means you, you come back when you've been refused. So he gives the story of a guy at midnight. Then he gives the story of a widow and an unjust judge. And this little widow, she, you know, I can think what's happened. She's a widow who's lost her husband, therefore is about to lose her house. But the brother-in-law, the man's brother who has died, is saying, it's my house, my land, because it's in my tribe. But the woman has said, no, it's my house. It's where my children live. It's, so it's a dispute. So they're bringing it to a judge. But the, but the brother, he slips the judge a $1,000 and says, rule in my favor, would you? And it was an unjust judge. He took the bribe, said, sure. So in comes, in comes Monday morning, the case, first case, the door's open. Down comes this widow. Judge, I, I, uh, you know, he's trying to take my land. It's my house and my children in here. And, and, and you, you, it's obvious. It's, it should be my house. And the, and the man says, no, it's in my tribe. It's in my, you know, it's in my name. It's in my brother's name. And judge looks concerned or whatever. He goes, bang, I rule in favor of the brother-in-law. He gets the land. The little widow goes nuts. She screams, what? You can't give him my land. That's my house. She says, woman, this is my courtroom. Be quiet. You can't scream like, I'm going to scream because you didn't give me my land. He said, bailiff, pick her up. Take her out. She goes out the door, arms and legs everywhere. Bang. Whew, that was hot. So he's sleeping that night, and he feels a little disturbed. He wakes up in the middle of the night because he's having a dream. He sees that little woman down in front of him. Next morning, Tuesday morning, he says, first case, doors open, boom. What are you doing here? She says, I am back here to get my house in line. You've got to reverse your decision. He says, I'm never going to reverse my decision. He said, you've got to reverse that decision. That land and that house belong to me. You know it does. You've got to turn it around. It's got to, you've got to make it rule against my brother. He says, I'm never going to do that. Once I brought that hammer down, it's up. she starts screaming, yelling, saying, no, you can't take my land on me. You can't. He says, bailiff, please take her out here. So they take her out. He looks down. His hands are a bit shaky. He says, all right, next case. And he goes through the day. On the way home, he hasn't smoked for about 20 years, but his hands are still shaking. So he picks up a pack on the way home, you know, just trying to calm down a little. At night, he can't go to sleep, and he's walking around. He's just about smoked the whole pack out now. Picks up another pack in the morning. Oh, he forgot to shave. Now he's sitting in the bench. It's his first case. It's Wednesday morning. Bang, the door's up. Digga, 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 digga. He said, what are you doing here? She says, I'm here to get my house and land, judge. You're not going to take my house and land off me. I want you to reverse that. He said, I'm never going to do it. Get her out of here. She's screaming, yelling. I don't want you to get my land. Bam. Oh. He's really shaken. He says, uh, no more cases today. I'm going home. So he goes home, picks up a bottle of gin on the way home and a, another packet of cigarettes. 
He's trying to calm down a little. He doesn't sleep hardly at all that night. He arrives late Thursday morning. He's sitting in the bar because the gin looks like water, so he brought it into the courthouse. <laughs> he's sitting down there and he's, he's like, oh, he looks down, he's still got his pajamas on. Uh, whoops. So, it's his first case. Bam. Dingy, 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 that's he comes. He goes, what are you doing here, woman? He says, I'm going to get my land. You're not going to deny me. I'm coming back for this land until you turn around. That he said, woman, well, please leave me alone. He starts crying, big black eye, things under his eyes. She says, well, you're going to reverse my decision. Turn it around. He says, all right, I will reverse the decision. Bam, the land and the house are yours. Now, please get out of my life. Amen. That's how you pray. Persistently, with importunity, you don't give up. <laughs> not that God is like that judge but what Jesus was saying the persistence of the woman won over a seemingly impossible situation faith is getting up again just because you got knocked down doesn't mean it's, it's never going to happen get up again you got a get up again kind of person on the inside of you it's called Jesus. And all you got to do is say, I'm going to get up again. I got to have another go at this. I'm going to get up again. You know, the colonel, when he was 65 years old, he had retired, waiting for his social security check, rocking backwards and forwards on his porch, thought, is this the rest of my life? So he made a, he made a list of 20 things that he, were kind of special to him. I think number seven on the list, or somewhere on the list was, his mother's fried chicken with seven herbs and spices. <laughs> so he went down to the local restaurant and he said, could I cook this? They said, sure. So he cooked it up in a little corner over there. It became the most popular item on the menu. Everybody wanted it. So he started his own shop. Then he had lines up trying to, trying to buy his Kentucky fried chicken. So then he thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a whole bunch of shops. But he needed a loan. So he went to the bank he said, I need a loan of about three million, start some franchises. They said, How long are you gonna to take to pay it back? He said, 30 years. They said, How old are you? 65. <laughs> Ain't gonna work. Cancel. No, denied, denied, denied. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One thousand banks. He just didn't give up. He just didn't give up. Finally got the loan. Since then, a lot of chickens have died. <laughs> but the thing is, he finally broke through. He achieved his dream. Do not think that just, just believing that a thing is going to happen is going to make it happen. Faith is activity. It's actually doing things to make it happen. All right, we go to the next one is receive it. You got to ask for it, but now you got you to actually receive it. About uh, three years ago, our daughter was pregnant with her second child. And so Chris and I went down to the medical center, and they, they do you call an ultrasound here? They do an ultrasound, and this machine goes over the belly of the mother, and up on a screen, you can see what's in the belly. So I'm sitting there watching this, put all this jelly over her, and it's like this. And you look up there, and there's this little, 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 little thing in the, in the screen, okay? A little baby. You go, wow. So here's the thing. If I was to come to you right now and put, put the ultrasound on your spirit, what's going to come up on the screen? What do you have on the inside of you right now about your future? If there's nothing there, then we need to... Go through those first three steps and conceive a reality within us. Because faith is walking by the substance of a reality on the inside of you. You've got it in here before it comes out there. Once it's in there, nothing can stop it from coming out there. But you got to know you got it down in here. It's a knowing that you have something. This church existed in the spirit of this pastor well before it was in the, in the reality. I'm not sure about him, but for me, it was kind of an anticlimax the day the building was finished. 
because I'd felt so excited about having something that nobody could see. I said, I got this church. I got it. I got a thousand churches on the inside of me right now. I got a hundred thousand people in Sydney worshiping God. And I got a whole bunch of other things that are none of your business, amen, that are in here. (laughs) What are you believing for? What have you received? Because that scripture says, when you pray, believe you receive it. You got to have it before you get it, otherwise you don't get it. You got to get it before you get it, otherwise it doesn't turn up. Okay, faith is the evidence of things not seen. You got to see it. Your imagination is a very powerful tool. That screen on the back of your forehead, what you're seeing there day in, day out, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're moving in the direction of your dominant thoughts. You're a heat-seeking missile. You're moving towards the hot number in your mind. Whatever your mind is dwelling on, that's where you're going. In fact, most people don't need a prophecy. Just tell me what you think about the most, what you envision the most. That's where you're going. That's how we are designed. That's why God gives visions to young men. That's why He gives dreams to older men. I get sort of vision dreams. (laughs) But you know, it's like, it's like, Whatever you've got in your head is where you're going. What you are seeing, where you're seeing yourself going. And I've had people in our Bible college discover this in a second. They work in a restaurant. They say, I'm going to lose my job because I haven't, we haven't, we're not getting enough, enough customers. And he, they heard me speaking on this because one of the subjects we do is how to work miracles and how to see these things come to pass. She said, so I just started believing it and seeing it and thanking God for it. And before we knew it, within a week, the place was filling up with people. And I kept my job. What do you see in the future? Because if you judge your future by your current facts, you're going you're gonna to have a negative picture in your mind. The devil will try and fill your mind with negative images. If your husband's three hours late from home, you got this imagination of an ambulance and hospitals and all things going wrong. Because we go to the negative too easily. It takes a decision to go to the positive. If I want to grow weeds in your garden, do you know what I would do? Nothing. They just grow. You want to grow weeds in your brain, do nothing. But you want to grow positive thinking, a positive mind, you got to make a choice. I'm going to pull out the weeds and put in some great thoughts. Because the thoughts in your head are the trees that you're growing. So if I wanted to, say I wanted to go to... uh, if I wanted to go to San Francisco, but I got on the train to Tijuana. I don't know if there is a train to Tijuana, but I guess there would be, Mexico City. Okay, so I get on the train to Tijuana, Mexico City, but I want to go to San Francisco, but I got on the train to Mexico, but I want to go to San Francisco. Where am I going to go? Where I want to go or the train I'm on? Obviously, the train of your thought is where you're going. Even though you want to go to prosperity, you keep thinking poverty. You want to you wanna have a great family, but you keep thinking disaster family. You keep thinking about all the bad things about your husband, all the bad things about your wife, all the bad things about your kids. You can change that. You can change your thinking. It's not out of control. I know some of you feels like a wild horse rumping around in there, it just goes off and does its own thing. It's like a typewriter, like this, it's tapping away. Some of you got about five channels going on there all the time. One's in Chinese, it's going, you got, you know, Latino going on in there, the argument you had with your mother, the, what are you going to have for breakfast in the morning, and the indigestion from the tacos you had for dinner, you know, it's all... You're having an argument with yourself about something. And occasionally my voice just pops through and you hear me. And, yeah, oh, you go, oh, that was a good point. Back to the... <laughs> Clean it up. Take control of your thoughts. Your mind is a great servant, but it's a lousy master. Rule it. Now I'm going to think about that. Now I'm going to think about that. You've got a sound mind. Amen. Amen. 
People don't realize they can actually control their thoughts. Okay, I got two more points. Say it. Everybody say, say it. Say it. You got to speak things. You see now, now, here's the thing. If you, this is a point that some people have a lot of difficulty with because their sincerity stops them from doing it. If I said, you know, like, you say, oh, I'm so hopeless at giving up smoking. I say, no, say, I, I'm so strong at giving up smoking. I say, how could I say that? I'm not. It'll be like lying. Well, just go ahead and be a sanctified liar. <laughs> Scripture says, let the weak say, I'm strong. How can I say I'm strong if I'm weak? Because the Bible says the truth is different from facts. The facts are, but the truth is. The facts are, I am weak, but the truth is, I'm strong. God created me strong. The facts are, I'm a little dumb with financial decisions. But the truth is, I'm extraordinarily wise. The facts are, people all think I'm a bit of an idiot. But actually, in truth, I have all the wisdom of God in my head. The facts are, my family's falling apart. But the truth is, my family's coming together. The facts are, I've got a habit in my life that I can't seem to kick. The fact is that the truth is Jesus broke all the chains. I am set free in Jesus' name. Speak it. You cannot underestimate the power of your words. At the beginning of creation, God said, let there be light. Who's he talking to? No one. No one's around yet. Which tells me that the first purpose of language is not communication, but creation. So this mouth is a creative force that I've got to cause things to happen that would never happen unless I said they would. That's why there are so many prophets in the Bible, because God has got them causing things to happen that wouldn't unless they said them. And the Bible says you may all prophesy. So as you start to speak over your world, this is going to work. This is going to happen. It may not work the first day, may not work the third day, sixth day, but it's going to work eventually because your circumstances will conform to your words. Your words have a creative force in them, a huge power. Abraham was told by God, I have made you the father of many nations. God is at the end of time. He's also at the beginning of time. He lives beyond time. Here's Abraham on the timeline. God says to him from down here, Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Here's Abraham. There's God saying, I have made you. Abraham doesn't have a child. He could look back and say, no, you haven't. But he believed God had. Because up here on the timeline, God had made him a father. Abraham's future was God's history. What was going to happen in the future, as far as God was concerned, had already happened. So he says, Abraham over there, I have made you. Church, rock church, I have doubled you. Rock church, I've paid all the bills. He believed it. And it was imputed to him for righteousness. He started to walk by faith and speak what God had said. Last one, act it. Action. Seventh step. Faith without works is dead. You gotta do something. You gotta step out and do something. If you don't do something, if you don't ask her to marry you, it's not gonna happen. Come on, you've been dating for four years. Get busy, Simon. Amen. Too many unwed mothers, women, single ladies in the church. I'm a pastor. I care about people too. Amen. Sometimes the guys go, oh, I don't know. But you're too fussy. Amen. And some of the girls are too fussy. Oh, he's a little bit tall. Oh, he's a little bit short. Oh, he's not quite, you know, all the good ones are taken. No, they're not. You should have seen us before we got took. (laughs) 
Huh? Sometimes kissing a frog works. Amen. <laughs> Boo, that prince. All you need is love. Yeah, so. Okay, okay, okay. Guys, guys, guys. Here, here's Luke 5. Don't, don't have to go there. I'll just tell you the story. Jesus is teaching from a boat. Finishes teaching, says to Peter, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. He says, Lord, I've been working hard all night and caught nothing. I want to go home. I want to have bacon and eggs, which is pretty liberated for a Jewish person. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> So he said, hey, uh, he's not happy. I know that he's not happy because he only takes one net. When Jesus said, take nets, he's been repairing and cleaning. He said, I'm not going to get him more clean. He's the carpenter. I'm the fisherman. <laughs> Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down there. I said, I follow Jesus. What do I do with that? <laughs> Here I go, I'll put down a net if he wants me to put down a net, I'll put down a net, and I'll go down there. All right, I'll go in the shallows so I can get home quickly. Hey, what would he know? He's the deep of the shallows. I said the deep, Peter, it's the deep. How do you know that one's not deep? You want deep? I'll give you deep, deep. So he's way out in the middle of this lake. Throws out the net, he says, see, there's no fish. <laughs> out here. Suddenly the net is full. Boom. There's all this barracuda in there. Boom, boom, boom. In comes a big white whale. Boom, boom. Puts his nose in there. This flock of geese fly in there. Boom. <laughs> Crabs, lobsters, dolphins, snap everything. Turtles coming in. This net is he's on the bow of the boat going around the lake like he's skiing. Finally crunches up on the shore. Now that's a tad exaggerated. He's up on the shore. He said, Jesus, forgive me. I never believed this could happen. But it did. When you step out, even when you're only half believing that it might happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. Things are going to turn around for you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, uh, just before I close... I, uh, I hate, no, well, I, don't, I, I just try never to, uh, you know, bring a talk or speak uh, anywhere without actually giving somebody an opportunity to say, you know what, i like to have him in my life. I want Jesus in my life. So if you've never prayed a prayer that says, God, come into my life, or you've been away from God, or you need to come back to him, or you're not sure you're going to heaven, Right now, I'd like you to, in a couple seconds, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. So if that's you, you've never prayed that prayer, God, come into my life, or you've been away from Him, it's time to come back. You haven't been to church for a while. Or you're just not sure you're going to heaven. I mean, you go to church, but you're not sure if you're going to heaven. Right now, wherever you are, in a couple seconds, like I said, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. So can I ask everybody to close your eyes right across this auditorium? And if that's you, wherever you are right now, put your hand in the air. Say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pray that prayer. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Who else is there? Just raise your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. I want to pray that prayer. I want to have Jesus Christ come into my life. I want to be born again. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. Way up the back there. I see your hand. I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge that. Who else is there? Just, I'm waiting for you. I'll wait another couple moments for anybody else. Then we're going to pray a prayer together. And at the end of the service, after it is dismissed, I want you to come to the front and the pastor will pray for you. You know the presence of God is in this room in a beautiful way right now. I'd like us all to stand, if we could, as we come to a close.
And I want us all just to pray that prayer. And those of you doing it for the first time, make sure you say these words and receive Christ in your life. And at the end of the service, please bring your friend, whoever you came with, make sure you come down the front and talk with the pastor about following Jesus. Amen. Can we all just say these simple words to God? Dear God in heaven, I receive Christ as my Savior. I repent from all sin. I renounce the devil. I accept Jesus as my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. Thank you, God, for saving me. Amen. Give the Lord a great clap offering. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a great shout. Praise His name. Woo! God bless you. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Right. Wasn't that wonderful? Real quick, while you're all standing, everybody that raised their hand, I want you to do something. I want to give you some free information, some free literature. You can take it home and read about it. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come up here right now. If you raised that or prayed that prayer for the first time, get out of your seat and come here right now. Come on. Come on. You prayed that prayer for the first time, so we can give that to you. You're going, that's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, get out of your seat and get up here right now. Come on. We're just going to give you something free. We're just happy about you doing it. I know there's some people back here. Get out of your seat and come. Come on. Come on. You prayed that prayer for the first time. Get out of your seat and come down here. Come on. Hurry, 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 hurry. Well, thank God you guys have come. This is Pastor Dave. He wants to give you that free information. Only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good?